nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. All right, it's nine o'clock, so I want to get started. Um, you know, so we'll be here from nine to about ten o'clock, and uh, you know, welcome. This is our first uh, seminar series for the new Micro Nanotechnology Education Center. Um, you know, and thank everybody for coming, and especially thank Greg and Frank. We're going to be giving the talk today uh, on photonics, um, um, and you know, I hope that you enjoy uh, today's seminar by Greg Kepner and. Uh, Frank Reed from Indian Hills Community College. So uh, take it away, Frank and Greg. Thank you, Jared. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about the Micro Nanotechnology Education Center uh, Photonics Workshops that we have coming up next year. I have with me today uh, my colleague and friend, Frank Reed. He's the principal investigator for another NSF grant called Developing Photonics Education in Iowa's Rural Secondary Schools. And uh, I am the co-PI on the Micro Nano Technology Education Center. So welcome everyone. And uh, today we're gonna talk about several different things. Uh, we're gonna talk about photonics, of course. Um, you know, some of the uh, photonics applications and education and photonics technicians, you know, what do they do and where do they work? Uh, and also, we're gonna give you information about attending a photonics workshop that we're gonna offer. And then we'll also give you a, a lesson in uh, how lasers work and some laser safety information and also some resources about photonics and uh, by no means a comprehensive list, but at least a place to, to start. <clears throat> This quote, the 21st century will depend as much on photonics as the 20th century depended on electronics, has been used in many places, including the National Photonics Initiative website. And uh, it, is, it is so true. So what is, what is photonics? Well, in the simplest terms, the science and technology of generating, manipulating, and detecting particles of light. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, generating, we're going to focus on generating light with lasers. Photonics includes many kinds of light, but uh, lasers is one we're going to focus on. Manipulating that light being done through optics, such as lenses, mirrors, uh, prisms, and so on. Um, and through machinery in some cases, we're manipulating light with those lenses. Detecting that light with electro-optic devices and then particles of light, which are essentially photons. So photonics is used in lots of different areas. Uh, one of the primary areas is manufacturing, uh, but several other areas that are becoming prevalent Med uh, medical, military, communications, IT, science research, it's even in entertainment. In manufacturing, there are a number of different applications. And this again is not a comprehensive list, but it includes quite a few. Some of these uh, processes you probably are familiar with, you know, welding, cutting, those kinds of things. Cladding, interesting process where you're adding material to a to a part in order to uh, strengthen it or affect it in some way maybe it's a a shaft that's worn down it's a very expensive shaft and you don't want to buy a new one you're going to build it back up add material to it and and then maybe to strengthen it in some way of course you know laser marking is done in, in lots of manufacturing uh, systems today you know hardening drilling peening Peening is an interesting process uh, where you're affecting a material by essentially impacting it. You're not, you're not heating it, but you're using a laser to impact that material and, and give it uh, to reduce metal fatigue, for instance. Uh, laser forming is a very interesting process where you're actually using a laser and, and causing metal to bend. I, I've seen this process. We've, we've done it 
to where we bent it at a 90 degree angle with a series of passes. Of course, additive manufacturing, you probably, you, know, you think of that as uh, 3D printing and such. Um, micro machining. Uh, I'll, I'll show you some examples of some of these uh, in a minute. Photolithography in the semiconductor industry to uh, treat the photoresist material and uh, through a mask so that you can uh, treat the photoresist material in, uh, in the uh, etch process. Another one that's been developed recently, rust removal, cleaning, and that kind of thing, where you run the laser through a specific type of a lens that creates essentially a, a line of laser, not, not, a, not a dot, but a line of laser that you can run across the surface and, and remove, uh, remove whatever it is. It might be paint removal or rust removal or whatever. And several of these other heat and surface treatment alignments you know, in the maintenance area, uh, lasers are used for alignments of, of shafts and, and motors and, and uh, you know, anything that has to be specifically aligned. Well, using a laser, you're going to have a perfectly straight line. Safety fencing, deposition, some other applications. Pictured here are some examples of lasers you know, cutting, welding, drilling, and then on the right is cladding. And, you know, they all look like they're, obviously it looks like there's sparks flying and light coming off of the, uh, of the pictures and so on. But uh, very interesting processes. Uh, if we have time at the end of this, we're, uh, I've got a couple of videos I'd like to show you that, in, that show uh, some manufacturing processes. Laser micromachining is something that has now uh, become pretty pretty prevalent, and we can do things with laser micromachining that cannot be done with mechanical, uh, for instance, milling or drilling or anything like that because of the geometries. You can see in this picture, uh, there's a diagram, I mean, uh, um, I'm sorry, a scale of 200 microns, which is basically 200 millionths of a meter. And so to, put, to make a hole that small, you have to have a laser. And we also shown as a picture of a, a rectangular hole that was done with a laser. And this, in this case, it's about a two millimeter hole. But, uh, and, and that could be done in, in some ways with a machining process, but the laser process, laser micro machining gives us uh, much greater capabilities. My colleague Frank and I saw uh, where uh, there was a demonstration of um, beads that were 300 microns wide and a hole was being essentially laser drilled through it that was 75 microns wide. And again, that's a process that you couldn't do if it wasn't for laser micro machining. Laser additive manufacturing, 3D printing. Uh, here's a, an example of, of laser additive manufacturing where powder is fed through a nozzle and a laser beam is directed to where that powder lands and you're uh, essentially creating a part in a 3D printing process where a layer at a time and you can uh, add to that Add to that layer. It can be metal materials. Uh, there's a variety of different uh, metals that are used now, you know, titaniums and such. Uh, plastics, different kinds of, of plastics that are used, but uh, th this is, again, allowing us to create uh, parts that can't be made in other ways. Um, In fact, I'm going to just tell you an example of uh, um, a part. Three, three. Uh, I'm sorry, GE makes a part that uh, it's a, a jet uh, fuel nozzle that is made through a through a metal laser added manufacturing process. That in, before it was, it, we were able to make that part with this process. It was actually made with 17 different parts that had to be attached to one another in different ways. 
And now that part is made with a uh, with this process. So uh, just to talk about laser micro machining, um, on the left here we have a, a diagram of a uh, const continuous wave laser being um, directed at a target material. Um, okay, we got somebody was needs to be muted here. Uh, but the dark area there is shown is the heat affected zone. And well, the reason it's heat affected is because it's a continuous wave laser continuously applying energy through laser light to the material. Well, that has effects on that target material. Uh, when the nanosecond laser was developed, uh, it reduced the heat affected area. Um, there's still a shock, uh, there's a shock effect on the material. But now we have picosecond and femtosecond lasers that are used that ha it happens so fast. A femtosecond is one times 10 to the minus 15th seconds and it happens so fast that the material, it's a cold process. There's no heat affected area. There's no uh, effect like in the, in the other, uh, in, in continuous wave or even nanosecond. And just to give you an idea, an analogy of, of how a femtosecond laser, uh, the timing of it. So it's, a, you know, one times 10 to the 15th seconds, 10 to the minus 15th. Uh, that's a very, very short period of time. But the analogy is that the on time of the laser is like the blink of an eye and the off time is off for 17 days. So if you think of that, that's a lot of off time uh, compared to the blink of an eye. And so ju that's just an analogy to give you an example of that you can maybe relate to with a, when a, with a femtosecond laser. Uh, in the medical field, there are lots and lots of applications now. One of the most common is LASIK, eye surgery. Um, laser scalpel, where you can, you're literally cauterizing as you go, uh, so it's literally a, a bloodless surgery. Uh, endoscopic surgery, photobiomodulation, which is a type of low-level laser therapy that uh, it helps reduce pain, it helps simulate cellular growth, and it's used in some cases, I, I know there's a, there's a chiropractor that uses this process uh, for back pain and, and uh, to regenerate growth in, in the cells in the back. There's cancer treatments, photodynamic therapy uh, for cancer treatments. Of course, you've got microscopy and spectroscopy. Uh, dermatology for burn and scar management. Hair and tattoo removal as well. Here's an example of some stents that were made using a, a laser cutting process, essentially. Um, and those stents are they're cut out of a tube and then they're able, if you know how a stent works, it's inserted uh, through an angioplasty process and then it's expanded within an artery to essentially unblock the artery from uh, the, the buildup of cholesterol in the arteries. And they come in different sizes. They're used, um, you know, very, very small sizes all the way to larger arteries and, and veins. Of course, lazy eye surgery. Um, this is a, a co very common process. I would suspect that some of the people on this uh, present in this presentation today have, have experienced lazy eye surgery. I've heard lots of good results from people. Um, there's a company that uh, hires graduates from Indian Hills Community College called Site Path Medical that uh, creates uh, the develop the uh, equipment to do that surgery and the technicians go in with the uh, they go in with the doctor they don't perform the surgery they actually make sure that the laser has uh, the, the calibration is right on the laser power levels and the and everything uh, 
alignments and all of those types of things before the surgery is, is conducted. Um, knee replacement parts. These are, these are parts that can be made through the laser additive manufacturing process and they can be customized from the actual patient that they can do a scanning process ahead of time and you know get the exact measurements of everything within that knee and when they when they do the LAM process they can build it exactly the way it needs to be customized for the for the patient there's uh, spine implants uh, also made by the LAM process and specifically bone replacement parts. Uh, examples here are shown uh, on a skull. If there's a, a skull injury or also a jaw, um, you know, and, and it could be any bone, any bone part, but these are, uh, again, customized for the patient. Military applications, lots and lots of those now. Uh, range finding becoming one, and some of these have also become, uh, you know, commercialized. Uh, you know, they're used golf courses. They use range finders. Uh, hunters use range finders. Uh, laser sights. Now, hunters can't use laser sights, but uh, in self-defense uh, situations, laser sights can be used. Uh, target designators. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Uh, sensor jamming. You know, so that uh, you can affect the communications of, of an enemy. Missile countermeasures. This is a this is a pretty neat application developed by Northrop Grumman whereby uh, a, a countermeasure uh, laser system can be mounted on an aircraft and if a heat seeking missile is fired at that aircraft the laser can can uh, track that missile and actually lead it away from the aircraft so that it detonates in an area safe uh, safely away from the aircraft and they've got a system that can actually track multiple uh, heat-seeking missiles at the same time. Uh, directed energy weapons. This is, uh, you know, firing a high-powered laser at a target. For instance, uh, I, you know, they have shot down drones and, and such uh, with these weapons. Um, strategic defense initiative. Some of you might remember that in the era of President Reagan. Uh, that was a uh, outer space uh, initiative to, you know, for defense. Uh, that was, it actually wasn't fully developed at the time, uh, but it was considered. And non RF or radio frequency communications is another application that, uh, you know, radio waves can be intercepted by by the enemy and, and perhaps uh, decoded or whatever, uh, non-RF communications, if it's a laser communicated, then that's a direct line of sight and can't be, uh, can't be interfered with or can't be picked up. Here's an example of a target designator application where a ground force, for instance, a soldier on the ground can point a laser at a target, in this case, a tank, and then a, a helicopter or an aircraft can send a laser seeking missile at that tank and uh, it'll, it'll track right to the target. That can be used on a building or, or whatever the, the target happens to be. Information technology has a lot of applications uh, where lasers are used, you know, data transmission, data storage, um, communication, fiber communications, free space, even underwater, and then who has not used a laser printer? Um, very common. And if you use CDs or DVDs or anything like that, you're, you're using lasers. Metrology, there's many applications, you know, interferometry, LIDAR, scanners, there's optical clocks, fiber optic sensors, and so on, uh, used in lots of places. In science and research, there are some interesting uses of, of uh, lasers. You know, photochemistry, laser cooling, nuclear, nuclear fusion at the National Ignition Facility in Lawrence Livermore, 
National Lab. Uh, and again, I, I'd like to show you a video of that if we have time at the end of how the lasers are used in that application, but it's, uh, it's using the, the world's most powerful laser uh, to create nuclear fusion. Um, remote sensing, spectroscopy, holographic techniques, uh, again, lots of applications. And even in entertainment, we've all seen laser light shows. Uh, there's outdoor projections and, and holography, special lighting and so on. So I want to talk just a little bit about uh, photonics education. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give an example of Indian Hills Community College has a laser and optics technology program that uh, offers an associate of applied science, 21 months, 81 credits, with 37 of those credits specifically in photonics based coursework. Uh, this particular program started in 1985, believe it or not, and uh, has over 700 graduates at this point. Enrollment, as in any program, goes up and down. Uh, in the past five years, the program has grown from 30 students to uh, right around 50, give or take. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, it has 22 in the second year right now. Um, so the skills gap is something that's often talked about and this information Obviously, with the with COVID situation, this information is, is changed. I don't have the latest, but uh, this uh, talked about uh, having, you know, 5.8 million young adults out of school and seeking work. 40% of employers citing lack of skills as a main reason for job vacancies. That's a lot. And two thirds of employers report difficulty filling open positions. Last week at the high tech conference, an employee employer panel discussed some of the, the needs that they have. And one thing they said was filling those technician roles is one of the biggest challenges that they have. Finding people with the right skills, ready for work, uh, you know, trained and ready to go is a challenge for them. A little food for thought. couple of graduates. One says, I hope I picked the right major and not the one that isn't hiring. So a photonics technician, you know, what is that? Well, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, you know, the, the ONET coding system says that it's it's someone who would build, install, test, and maintain optical or fiber optic equipment such as lasers, lenses, or mirrors using spectrometers, interferometers, or related equipment. And there's a lot when it says in the related equipment, that includes a lot of stuff now. Um, their data uh, has said that uh, in 2019, the median wages were 62,990. And uh, that description is, again, by no means comprehensive. Uh, I could come up with probably 10 more job descriptions that where a photonics technician fits into that category. Um, job placement for laser and optics graduates, and this is specifically with Indian Hills, uh, they average, you know, five or more job opportunities per graduate. Uh, right now, we have graduates in 40 states plus Europe. They're placed at 140 different companies from, you know, California to New York, from Bozeman, Montana, down to Florida, and consistently job placement over 95%. Typically, if there's someone who doesn't take a job, it's because they don't want a job or they don't want to move to a different location for whatever reason. This year's average salary, even during COVID, this, this class has, has found work in, a, in several different locations, but the average starting salary this year for 
graduates of this two-year program were 62,800. This is a, a list that just shows companies that have hired in the last five years. And there's uh, 26 companies listed here. Um, that doesn't include the 114 that hired in the first 20 years of the program. Uh, some of these obviously did hire in that, but uh, you won't recognize some of these companies. I mean, a lot of these are small companies You'll recognize the Texas Instruments, the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, maybe the Boston Scientific, some of those. But some of these companies are, you know, 100 employees or, you know, just a few hundred or, or so. Well, we are planning to offer a couple of uh, workshops next summer, Fundamentals of Photonics workshop, as well as a laser material processing workshop. Now, you see a quote here by Leonardo da Vinci you might wonder why I would put a quote from 500 years ago. Well, if you read it, it's talking about hands-on activities. You know, he's been impressed with the urgency of doing. Knowing is not enough, we must apply. Being willing is not enough, we must do. Okay, I agree. Doing is very, very important and these workshops include hands-on activities. Okay, I need to, I'm trying to, there we go. So our Fundamentals of Photonics workshop, our dates have yet to be determined. We're kind of doing, taking a little bit of a wait and see with, with COVID and, and we may need to develop this all virtual. I don't know yet. We're gonna, it's in flux, but we are gonna offer it one way or another. Ideally, it'll be a five day face-to-face. -face. Uh, we'll be covering laser and light concepts laser safety, and include laser-based laboratory activities. Here's some examples of, you know, workshops that uh, uh, Frank and I worked on in the past. Uh, people using some kits and working in a laser lab, working with a fiber laser, you know, doing lab activities. Again, some more lab activities, you know, working in a laser lab. And we have been known to take a show on the road. So that's an option as well. A laser material processing workshop, again, dates to be determined. We hope to have a five day face to face. Uh, we will do some laser material processing theory, uh, have some, some expert presentations. Uh, we have some, some local folks that uh, have been doing this for a little while that will, have, will come and help us with that. Uh, we'll do some laboratory activities. Here's a variety of different things we might do. Welding, cutting, marking, engraving, forming, cleaning. And this, this workshop wouldn't be complete without some company tours to actually see laser system, multi-million dollar laser systems in operations. Here's an example of, of one of the laser systems we would use, uh, a true laser Trump, true laser station 5005 laser welding system. Here's a laser marking system. It can also be used for cutting. Uh, here's an example of some folks doing a, doing a laser material processing workshop, you know, adjusting parts in a fixture, watching the laser welding system, uh, adjusting program parameters, again, examining a welded part through a microscope and, and, you know, loading parts in the system. Again, some people uh, doing some hands-on activities. Okay, take a minute, stand up and stretch. Okay, so you've had some stretch time. Let's, uh... Uh, start off with this. We call it a laser. It's really an acronym, light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. A little history, when they first uh, decided to create this uh, system, this machine, this equipment, they called it oscillation. 
by stimulated emission of radiation. And you can figure out what that acronym would have been then, not laser, but loser. A little bit of history uh, more. Uh, 1917, Albert Einstein said, hey, we can do this. 53, they did something with a microwave and had a maser. In 58, uh, they talk, talked about having optical measures. And then they actually created the first working laser in 1960, and it was a 694 nanometer red light laser. It took them 60 years uh, since then. We've been in this, uh, laser's been in business for over 60 years. And if you put that into uh, relationship with the, uh, electricity, which has been around for over 141 years. So uh, uh, we have come a long way in a very short period of time. And then, of course, the uh, first Heaney was built in 6062. And ever since then, it's been a definite explosion of technology and applications. Lasers, they have wavelength, they have, uh, mon they're monochromatic, they're directional, they're coherent, they have power, and we've talked about pulse rates. Wavelength just means we can actually measure the length of a wave, uh, 690 nanometers, uh, 1064 nanometers, uh, monochromatic, one color, one wavelength, directional, I can point it anywhere I want to. Coherent means all the uh, wavelengths, all the waves in the laser beam are in step. And of course we can have power and we can pulse, pulse just like hitting a switch on and off on a flashlight, but a lot faster. We have to have uh, optics though, without optics, the laser won't work. Uh, that's, it's, uh, we can create, uh, uh, ec excitement, I'll talk about that a little later, e excitation mechanism, but without the optics, nothing will work. And here uh, in, in this business, they use lenses, mirrors, filters, and a host of others. Um, any laser beam reacts with all materials in one of these five ways. It either scatters it, the light, it transmits the light, it absorbs the light, it reflects it, or it refracts it. Uh, I think you got a good idea what scatter means, transmit, you know, what light goes through a, a window. Absorb, if we don't have absorption, you're not going to do anything with the laser light. You're not going to do cataract eye surgery, you're not going to do LASIK eye surgery. It must be absorbed. Um, it reflects, you know that for a fact, light reflects, and to refract means it just bends. Oh, refract, uh, that's why you see those really pretty rainbows. Nature of light, this is just a little bit um, uh, about the electromagnetic wave, uh, the visible spectrum, blue to red, and uh, it gives you an idea of the actual length, if you will, of each of the uh, waves. 400 is blue, 700 is red. This is, gives you an idea of the actual spectrum itself. Uh, as you look at this, you can see um, that the visible is a very, very small portion of the whole spectrum, from gamma rays to radio waves. And then you see down at the very bottom of that, you see all the different lasers uh, types that are, you see the Heaney there, the 633, the Ruby we talked about, and some other things. Monochromatic, uh, directional, coherent, I pretty well went through that, but knowing what that is, uh, Without that, you couldn't focus a laser beam the way we can. And it says 100 times better than ordinary light. If you think of a fluorescent light bulb or, or even a phosphorus light bulb or so forth and so on, even an LED, uh, the, the, that type of light hasn't got the ability to focus that a laser light does because it's so much more pure and uh, this is one of the reasons why even low levels of laser light can produce significant eye damage uh, depending on the use and so forth. Of course, now we use them for LASIK eye surgery and for cataract eye surgery. So depending on how you do it, it's okay. This is how it works real simply. I have to have an excitation mechanism, may it electricity, may it be other light. I have to have an active medium, which in case the Heaney gas or uh, an Indy egg, um, a solid state. And if I don't have the two mirrors, like I said, on each end, the output coupler and a high reflective mirror, 
it's not going to work because what they keep the photons in check keep them along the optical axis and therefore we have a beam that comes out to the right the highly reflective uh, mirror is supposedly we're going to say 100 percent reflective and the output coupler mirror is between 95 98 percent depending uh reflective i should say and then it allows the output beam a few lasers to look at uh Everybody, I think everybody knows what a laser diode is, a pointer, I mean. Um, you used to be able to buy them at Walmart for a buck and a half. That's the one in the middle, a little silver one. Um, you can see, I, I'm going to say this real quick. The ones that are the red, green, and blue, they can have various powers. Uh, well, some of these use them in, uh, uh, teachers use them for pointers. Everybody's used one. The one on the far right, that one is not just a pointer. That's a weapon, and you may have heard uh, about the use of those lately in the news in, in different cities. Uh, so you have to be careful with these things. Here's the difference between a, a red one and a green one. Note that the green one is longer, and it has a lot more optics going on there, and uh, that's why it's green. And quite frankly, uh, you come to the uh, laser workshops next year, and I'll tell you exactly how that works. Here's a Heaney. We have several of these in, the, in our lab here at Hills. Uh, we use them. Uh, used to be the, the most used educational type laser, but now the uh, laser pointer and laser diodes have taken over. Here's an ND YAG. No, note what it is. It's neodymium, yttrium, aluminum, garnet. I don't know who the guys were that sat around and thought up all the stuff to make, make these work, but they work. This is 1064 nanometers and this is the one that's used uh, highly in industrial like welding cutting and drilling that Greg was talking about earlier. Carbon dioxide laser CO2 more complex it's an older model they've been around for a long time uh, and they also are well, also are uh, one of the workhorses of manufacturing. A fiber laser uh, we well, say it's newest it pretty much is but uh, it's still been around about 10-12 years which in in the uh, uh, relative time, 60 years, that shows you about how long it's been around. And these things are compact and they're building them to um, actually put out a lot of power. We have a box in the laser lab that's about a foot by two foot by another two foot and it puts out 100 watts of power. And we can also pulse it to get a whole lot more in the kilowatt range if we wish to. And th th these are really, these are taken over in industry. Okay, we have power. We've talked about uh, what it can do damage to the eye. Uh, here's the reason people get hurt. They don't get a good enough training or they don't follow the training. And uh, next year, uh, you come to these two training uh, weeks and we will make sure that you have adequate training and we'll also make sure that you follow the training uh, because that's very important and then that make sure that we don't want anybody getting hurt. The, the, um, the laser uh, photonics workshop, the lasers we use that week are 1.5 milliwatts and less, 1.2 milliwatts and less. The laser material processing week, we use uh, high powered systems, upwards of 200, 300 watts, but most of those are encased in a system. You're gonna see that a little bit later. Um, where they don't, uh, the, the beam is not out where you can see it, but we do have one that we use where we have the laser beam out in the, out in the air on the labs uh, tables, so you'll have to be really careful with those. But you can do it. Different types of eye exposure, intra beam, don't look down the beam of, of the barrel of a laser, that just, that just doesn't make any sense. If it's reflecting off of a mirror, and mo if, depending on type of mirror it is, it can have a lot of reflection. And of course, a diffuse uh, reflection, if it's a high enough power, uh, like over five to 10 watts, it, it can still cause you some trouble. A couple of pictures, hopefully they're not too disturbing, but uh, this one on the right is an eye, one on the left is a guy's thumb. Uh, we wear these all the time. When we're dealing with a high powered system, we wear safety goggles. Now, notice all the different colors. Well, that's because they're all for different wavelengths. So one does not fit all. 
And we have all these in our lab, so you won't have a problem uh, not having the right kind of eyewear. But don't think that the eyewear is the catch-all for laser safety. It is not. So, uh, most eye injuries occur when a person is not wearing their safety eyewear. Uh, it doesn't make you invulnerable. You're not supposed to stare into the laser beam. Some of this stuff is what we would call common sense. But infrared lasers, IR lasers, you can't see that beam and it is therefore more hazardous. And we have different um, classes of uh, lasers, 3B, 4. I've got a list here a little bit later. I'll go through that real briefly. Uh, but every uh, eyewear that we have has ratings on it. And you can see here an optical density of set, I'm on the green one, an optical uh, density of seven at 100 nanometers to 380 nanometers which is higher than an optical density of three. So the, the UV 190 to 380 has a higher optical density, more safe than the, the other ones at 800 to 839. Class one, that's your 1.2, one, two milliwatt or less laser and up to, up to class four, which is the laser that if it's, the beam is not housed, then uh, you have to be so careful uh, and wear the goggles all the time and so forth. So it's kind of like having a water pistol and a class one and have a 30 out six and a class four. You just got to be careful with everything, no matter what. And so now we come well, to the end of this. Uh, this is some good websites of interest. Uh, you're going to be receiving this uh, PowerPoint so you can look at some of these if you wish to. All right, cool. Is that the is that the end, Greg? Yeah, we're at the end of the of the slide deck. Um, but we we would take some questions if if there's anyone out there that has any questions. And then if if not, we've got a couple of videos we can show real quick that are pretty neat to watch. Wasn't the laser? Wasn't there like a big patent battle with gold and towns? Yes. Yeah, wasn't it? I thought that didn't didn't Gold end up winning it because he had a lab notebook that was done correctly? And, yeah, yeah, yes, he did. He and did Towns win it. didn't. <laughs> um, Doctor Charles Towns was a. Um, I, I was actually able to see the guy and listen to him talk on the fiftieth anniversary of the laser, and um, very nice gentleman, very stately. But yeah, uh, he and uh, well, it wasn't so much him. It was the people behind him that tried to get that. But um, yep, there was a battle. Yeah, what would you rather have, the patent or the Nobel Prize, Greg? <laughs> <laughs> I'd take either. <laughs> hey, right. uh, do we want to watch a, an interesting video? Yeah, maybe that'd be kind of cool to watch a video and then we can uh, introduce what will happen next week. If that's all right. Matt Plyle wants to know, do students have trouble with photons versus waves and how do you address that? No, students do not have trouble with photons versus waves. And uh, photons, if you make it real simple, photons are like BBs bouncing off of a desktop. Waves are like throwing a pebble into a, a pond and how waves react with uh, different uh, other surfaces. I only have one screen here, so. And there was a question, um, do you address photonic integrated circuits? Greg, it's because the YouTube audio is muted. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I didn't realize that. I'll, I'll send you the link. Well, if you just Google search how NIF works, if you Google search how NIF works, you, it'll take you to it. Um, so I only have one screen here, so I'm not, I can't pull down the website. You know, it, it talks about the laser, 192 lasers. And you can see right now they're, they're actually going into the chamber 
they are going to all converge at a very tiny point, a hall rom, which is where the fusion occurs within this very tiny chamber. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't know how to. Gotcha. Well, I, when, when, I, when I was at Lawrence Berkeley Labs, we worked at the cyclotron with all their little lasers coming off of those. Thanks everyone. Right. Cool. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming and see you next next time. <laughs>